Hello Algebra Scholars. There are four parts to the Common Core Algebra Regents, and we're going to be looking at parts three and four today from the January 2017 Regents. Let's jump right on in. Let's start with question number 33, and it says, graph f of x equals the absolute value of x, and g of x equals negative x squared plus 6 on the grid below. All right, and so, well, what do we know? We know that this is an absolute value function, and it's going to take the shape that looks a little bit like this. And we can see that this is a quadratic function. And because it's negative, it's going to take a shape like that. Because it's negative, it's got a little frown face. It's looking sad. And what else do we know? It says, does f of negative 2 equal g of negative 2? And we're going to have to use a graph to explain why or why not. What's the first step? How, how exactly do we approach this? Well, if we're looking at this grid, we can see this graph, this grid, we can see it's not labeled. Let's start with drawing the y-axis. Amazing. Let's draw the x-axis. You can't forget that. Tremendous. And we'll draw the, uh, we'll graph this um, f of x equals this absolute value of x. And we know that this is going to be starting at the origin point, 0, 0, right? Nothing indicates that we're going to be rising or falling on the y-intercept. And because the slope is 1, it's just going to go up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. So it looks a little bit like this to the right, and then to the left, it's mirroring it as all absolute um, value functions do. Tremendous. And we're good to go. What about this other one, this um, quadratic equation? I can see that it says negative x squared plus 6. So are we going 6 to the left, the right, down? Nope, we're going to go 6 up. And I know it's going to look like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, it's going to be right there. Okay, tremendous. Um, and then what exactly does a um, quadratic equation look like? We're going to shift over one uh, this way, one to the left, one to the right, and so on and so forth. And then what we're going to do is we're going to simply connect it, and it's going to look a little something like this. Um, that's more or less good. All right, so we've got something that looks pretty compelling, and I know that if you want a more precise graph, um, you can pop it into your graphing calculator and it's going to come up and it's going to look exactly like that. And so why exactly did we did I highlight that? What's the significance of this intersection right here? Well, don't forget that the question asked us, it says, does f of negative 2 equal g of negative 2? And it says it wants us to use our graph to explain why or why not. Huh. And actually, if you notice the graph of f of x which is the red one, right? The graph of f of x intersects the graph of g of x. The blue one is g of x at negative 2, at x equals negative 2. Let's put a little arrow, right? So x equals negative 2 at that specific location. Okay. And so does f of negative 2 equal um, g of negative 2? It sure does. Um, this inter intersection indicates that there is a solution that the graph of f of x intersects okay the graph of g of x oops at x being negative 2. So they're equal to each other. So what we can do is we can conclude this by saying f of negative 2 equals g of negative 2. And if you do this, if you write that and you graph this appropriately, what you're going to do is you're going to earn yourself um, full credit. You're going to earn yourself 100% A plus for this particular problem. Let's take a look at question number 34, and it says, Two friends went to a restaurant and ordered one plain pizza. So I'm going to represent one plain pizza by writing 1P. And two sodas, I'm going to represent that as 2S, and I can see that their bill totaled to be $15.95. Um, so later that day, it says five friends went to the same restaurant. They ordered three plain pizzas. I'm going to rewrite that or represent that with 3P. And each person had one soda. So I know that there was five friends, and if each one has one f soda, that's going to be 
S. Does that make sense? All right. And it says that their bill totaled $45.90. The question says, write and solve a system of equations to determine the price of one plain pizza. And we're only looking for an algebraic solution. Um, all right. So what method are we going to use? I would highly recommend that you guys use the elimination method. And uh, let's, let's do that right now. So it says... Uh, one plain pizza and two sodas equal to fifteen ninety five. I'm gonna write that like one p plus two sodas equals fifteen dollars and ninety five cents. All right, so we we know that, and don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that we're trying to determine the price of one plain plain pizza. That's our objective. Um, and later that day, five friends went, and we know that. Uh, three pizzas were purchased, and we know that five sodas shouldn't drink soda. They should be drinking water, but nonetheless, the total of their bill came out to be forty-five ninety uh, ninety cents. All right. So the elimination method. How does this work, and why are we doing it? Well, what we want to do is we want to determine the price of one plain pizza. So what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate the value of um, S, in this case, sodas. So how do we do that? Um, we want to get this so the coefficients are equal but have opposite signs for each of these equations. So I can see that this is 2, 2S, obviously, and the coefficient here is 5. What we're going to do is if we multiply this top equation by 5 and the bottom equation by negative 2, um, what's going to happen is the uh, values of the, or the soda variable will be eliminated so we can identify this, the price of one plain pizza. Let's do this. All right. So we're going to be distributing 5 into 1P, the 2S, and then to 15.95. And when we do that, we know that uh, 5 times 1P is going to give us 5P. Uh, 5 times 2S is going to give us positive 10S. And then 5 times 15.95 is going to be um, $79.75. Let's distribute negative 2 into the bottom equation. And negative 2 times 3P is going to give us negative 6P. Negative 2 times 5S is going to give us negative 10S. That's crucial right there, ladies and gentlemen. And then negative 2 times $45.90 is going to give us $91.80. And eighty cents. All right, and so here we've got the elimination method in practice. All right, so ten s minus ten s cancels out. All right, and what do we know? Negative six p plus five p is going to give us negative one p. And then when we we're of course combining like terms. Um, oh, you know what? I made it. I made a mistake. I neglected to make this. A negative 9180. That's really crucial. Um, attention to detail will uh, very critical in these these kinds of problems. All right, um, negative 9180 plus 7975 is going to give us negative 1205. And um, I know that we can't have a negative one pizza, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide both sides by negative 1. And when we do, we've got P equals $12.05. One pizza equals $12.05. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hope that makes sense. Let's take a look at question 25. Tanya is making homemade greeting cards. The data table below represents the amount she spends in dollars, f of x, in terms of the number of cards she makes, x. Okay. We're going to have to write a linear function, f of x, that represents the data. All right. How do we start? Well, the first thing we need to do is recognize that um, this linear function is going to be written like y equals mx plus b. And we know that m is the slope, and we know that b is the y-intercept. How do we figure out what the slope is? How do we figure out what the y-intercept is? Uh, let's analyze this a little further. So the slope is what? That's the amount that it increases in the f of x column. And, and there's a few different ways we could go about um, doing this. We know that from 9 to 10, which is a consecutive one-step jump, it um, goes up by 0.75 
in the context of this problem, 75 cents. Um, and because this is linear, we know that it's consistent um, throughout, so that m equals 0.75. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just a critical way of uh, looking at this. If it's not as clean cut as this, what's an alternative way we could sort of analyze and determine the slope? Well, we can see that it jumps from 6 to 9, and so likewise we can do 11.25 minus 9, and what does that give us? That gives us two dollars and twenty-five cents, and we know that two twenty-five divided by three, right? And why are we dividing by three? Because um, nine minus six is three. I'll write that too. Uh, nine minus six is three. We then know in this case that m would also be obviously, of course, 0.75. Great. So now, how do we figure out what b is? Well, um, I know that if we were asked to graph this, but we're not, but if we were asked to graph this, it would look a little something like this. Um, there's this startup cost, and we don't know what that is yet, but we know that the slope is going up by 0.75 each time. So how do we figure that out? Well, right now that we know that x is 4, right? Um, and at x, um, when x is 4, f of x is 0.75. So what can we do? We're going to have to go back four slots. Um, and we know that if we multiply four, oops, we know that if we multiply four by 0.75, that's going to give us what? Three. So if we subtract three from um, 750, that's going to give us four and a half, right? 750 minus three is four and a half. Oh, and so when x is zero, I'll write that right here. So when x is 0, f of x is 4.5. Oh, okay. So now all of a sudden we've got our linear function. We're going to write that like, um, just like this. f of x equals 0.75x plus 0.5. We've got our slope. We've got our y-intercept. Amazing. Um, and so now, of course, we would know that this spot right there, is what? 0, 4.5. All right, that, that's that coordinate. Does that make sense? Okay. And it says, explain what the slope and y-intercept of f of x mean in the given context. So what is the given context? Um, she's making homemade greeting cards. And so the, the, what, what you're going to write is that the slope means that she's spending 75 cents on each card, right? Maybe that's um, labor and material costs. And the y-intercept says that she spent $4.50 initially. So that's like the startup costs, right? This is really small, but if we were to scale this, that might be like the cost of purchasing a factory or um, whatever those huge initial startup costs might be. So I'm going to write this out. You can jump ahead if this makes sense, but I'm going to write the slope means she spends... She spends 75 cents on each card. All right. Um, and the y-intercept, just like we saw in that graph a second ago, and the y-intercept, what? It says that she spent, the significance, significance is that she is at she spends or spent four dollars and fifty cents to start this business this little money-making endeavor tiny is quite the uh, entrepreneur amazing question 36 says alex launched a ball into the air the height of the ball can be represented by the equation h equals negative 8t squared plus 4t plus 5, where h is the height in units and t is um, the time in seconds after the ball was launched. Okay, and then it wants us to graph this equation from t equals 0, from 0 seconds to 5 seconds. And we know that because this is a quadratic equation, the shape of the graph is going to look a little bit like this, which makes sense if Alex is launching a ball and the air gravity is going to start pulling the ball down maybe right here until it eventually hits the earth 
or someone catches it. Um, there's two ways to approach this problem. The easiest and the most efficient way would be to simply use your TI-83 calculator. You're going to go to the Y equals menu, and when you do, you're going to plug in um, this equation. Uh, it's going to look like negative 8 squared, I'm sorry, negative 8x squared plus 40x plus 5. And when you do, you can um, use your functions um, or use those uh, pretty cool techniques to figure out what the maximum is. And we know what we do, left bound, right bound, estimate, and it'll give us 2.5 comma 55, meaning that at 2.5 seconds into the throw, it hit its peak, which was um, 55 feet in the air. We know that this is the y-intercept. It started at 0 comma 5, and we're only graphing it to 5, but it hit the ground or someone caught it at 5.122 seconds. All right, so using your... Um, calculator you could then scale this graph accordingly and uh, simply pop it in but if you wanted to do it um, algebraically we would need to figure out what the axis of symmetry is or the AOS right and so we know that the formula for AOS is negative B over 2a all right and so what's negative B so it's going to be negative what's B 40 divided by um, 2a and a in the context of this is negative 8. Great. And so um, this is going to be, I'll shift over here, negative 40 over negative 16. And what does that give us? That gives us 2.5. Amazing. All right, so that's the axis of symmetry. 2.5 is the number of seconds um, when the ball reaches its peak. All right, so then how would we figure out what the height is algebraically? What we're going to do is we're going to plug um, two and a half back into that equation. And so it's going to look like, uh, I'll do this as best as I can. I'll shift this over here. And that's going to look like um, negative eight, open parentheses, 2.5. Again, we're replacing T which is two and a half seconds, um, with 2.5 plus 40, open parentheses, 2.5, close parentheses, plus 5. All right. And when you do that, what does that give you? Give us, well, if you've got your handy-dandy calculator, you're going to know that it's 55, and here it's going to be 55 feet. All right. So we're, we're good to go. We know that the height is open parentheses, 2.5 comma 55. That's the coordinate, that's the xy value. I think, I'm pretty sure that it's 32 across. So what I'm gonna do, and what you're gonna do to label it, I'm gonna um, skip one, I'm sorry, skip two boxes for each second. So, like so. I'll just go all the way across for good measure. Amazing. All right, and what about the y-axis and height? Um, I know that we've got to get up to 55, right? So I'm going to count by fives. I'll count by fives. Oops, 50. I got excited, 55. Get excited again, 60. 65, 70, 75. Okay, great. All right, so now what we need to do is we've got to graph this, right? So where is it starting? We know, based on this equation, that 5 is the y-intercept. That's where it's starting, right? Um, so I'm going to put the first dot right there at 0 seconds. It's right there. And then where is the peak? 2 and a half in, which is right here. I'm going to go up to 55, and it's right there. Okay, beautiful. And then it actually comes back to Earth a little after uh, 5, I think it was 5.1 we saw in the calculator. You can actually use the roots to find that earlier. So what we're going to do is we're going to graph it like so. Okay, beautiful. All right, that's not, 
you know what, let's, I'm going to try that one more time to give it a little bit more curvature. I'm going to zoom in. All right. All right, sorry about that. It's going to look like this. You guys are going to do a much better job on the regions. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. oh, man, this is not, this is not amazing. All right, let's say it looks, yeah, that's not bad. All right, there we go. And so it says, the second part of this question asks us to state the coordinate of the vertex and explain its meaning in the context of this problem. Well, I've already said this out loud at length, um, but I'm going to write it right now regardless, which is the vertex, right, the highest point in this, in this graph is 2.5 comma 55. Which means what? Which means that the ball started to fall after two and a half seconds at a height of what? At a height of 55 feet. Amazing. Let's take a look at question 37 where Ian is borrowing a thousand dollars, all right, from his parents to buy a notebook computer. He plans to pay them back at the rate of $60 per month. All right, well that's gonna be our rate. And his buddy Ken is borrowing 600 bucks from his parents to purchase a snowboard. He's gonna pay his parents back at $20 per month, all right. And it wants us to write an equation that can be used to determine after how many months the boys will still owe the same amount. All right, so we're going to be setting um, Ian's loan equal to Ken's loan to determine um, after how many months they're going to be owing the same amount. And to do that, we know that we're going to be starting off with $1,000 because that's how much um, Ian is initially borrowing from his parents. And we're going to be subtracting 60 bucks per month, right? X. Um, represents months and a thousand minus 6x is equal to what well uh, Ken is borrowing $600 for a snowboard maybe that's a lot I don't know and uh, he's gonna be paying them back at what $20 per month right so each month we're gonna be subtracting 20 bucks from this initial loan of $600 and this is this is the equation so we're done with the first part of this problem and it says determine algebraically and state in how many months the two boys will owe the same amount state the amount they owe at this time so there's two components to this question we're gonna need to figure out how many months and we're gonna need to figure out uh, the amount they will owe and to do that we're gonna have to solve for X so I'm gonna rewrite this equation that we just created and I know that we're gonna have to combine like terms and so to do that, I'm going to, let's see, we're going to add 60x to one side. And if you do it to one side, you're going to have to do it to the other. And I recognize that it cancels out right here. And so we're left with um, 1,000 equals 600 plus 40. All right. And then again, we're going to have to subtract 600 from this side. Do it to one side. You got to do it to the other. And we're left with what? 400 equals 40x. And then finally, to solve for x, we're going to divide both sides by 40. We're doing the inverse operation of multiplication, right? And, uh, 40 times x, and in this case, it's going to be division. 40s cancel out. And x equals what? Zeros cancel out. 40 divided by 4 is 10 x equals 10 oh okay so after 10 months because x of course represents months after 10 months the two boys will owe the same amount we're not done yet we've got to figure out the amount that they're going to owe at this time so we're going to take 10 and we're going to plug it back into this equation and uh we're running out a little bit of space here um but i know that if we do um, and you can actually pop it back into either equation. So you can pop it back into the left side, or this is a single equation, but pop it back into the left side or the right side. And let's do 600 minus 20 open parentheses. And instead of X, I'm going to be writing 10. And I know that 600 
minus 20 times 10 is what? 200. And 600 minus 200 is 400. Okay, so $400. At 10 months, um, they will both owe $400. At 10 months, they'll both owe $400. Great. So what we can write is, you know, at 10 months, they, they both owe, they owe 400. All right, so this is explaining the, uh, the meaning of this problem in context. Right, and let's take a look at this last part. It says, Ian claims that he will have his loan paid off after six months. I'm sorry, Ian claims that he will have his loan paid off after, uh, six months after he and Ken owe the same amount. Determine and state if Ian is correct and explain your reasoning. So we need to know um, a few things. It says six months after he and Ken owe the same amount. Well, how many months um, is it when he and Ken owe the same amount? It's ten months. And we it's asking us um, if we're going to have his loan paid off six months after ten. So that, of course, is going to be sixteen. And so we know that Ian is the guy who's buying the notebook computer, right? So we're looking um, at this part of the equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 1,000 because that was the initial value of that loan, right? Uh, minus 60, and then in parentheses, what are we putting? We're not putting 10, we're not putting 6. We're going to be putting 16, because this is 6 months after um, he, and his Ken, he and Ken owed the same amount. And this is equal to... can set this equal to Y. Beautiful. All right. So now we need to multiply... Okay. 60 times 16, if you got your handy dandy calculator, you know that's 960 equals y. Uh, wait a second. Doesn't seem like the loan is going to be paid off because I know that 1,000 minus 960 isn't zero. It's 40. It's $40. Ian is still going to owe $40 after 16 months or after six months when uh, he and Ken owe the same amount. So what we can write is a couple of things. You're going to explain this using your own words. You might write something like Ian is wrong, is incorrect, right? Because it's not going to be paid off, paid off after six months when it's equal. It says it's not, um, he's incorrect because six months after... He and Ken owe the same amount. What? He still owes his parents how much? He still owes his parents. He still owes his parents. Forty dollars! Exclamation point. Um, and so, if you write that, um, that should be an adequately that should adequately capture uh, what your graders want to know. Uh, well done. Good luck, guys.